Today's reading is from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 18. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justus, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heriopolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it also is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossae so many years ago, but which is your word that speaks to us today. And so we pray that we would have ears to hear, hearts to receive your word today. And we pray this for your glory. Amen. Ah, so what you can see behind me uh, is a picture of a very famous uh, mountain called El Capitan in um, Yosemite National Park, California. Now, what you're looking at is known as the Dawn Wall. It is a sheer cliff of granite, 914 metres high. Okay, so for a bit of comparison, there you've got a, an image, of, a shadow, like an outline of the Burj Khalifa, which is that the tallest building uh, in the world at the moment in Dubai at 828 metres. Uh, and I also added in uh, Bluff Mountain out in the Warren Bungles. That sheer face of Bluff Mountain is maybe 250 that's how big El Capitan is. Now, why am I telling you about this? Because there was uh, a, a documentary a, num- a few years ago now called Free Solo about a na- man named Alex Honnold. He's a rock climber and he climbed the Dawn Wall, which many climbers do, uh, depending on your expertise. Some take two days to climb it and they have these little uh, uh, kind of bivvies, if you like, that they... Uh, anchor to the wall and sleep in. Would you like to sleep halfway up that? Anyway, uh, some can climb it much faster, including Alex. Now I'm going to show you a picture of, that, come, that comes out of the documentary and I want, I want you to see if you can see what's a little odd. What's missing? Ropes. That's why it's called free solo. He climbed the Dawn Wall without ropes. That's nuts. Right, but we're drawn to the idea of, well, we we recognize that that is an incredible feat. Right, just overcoming fear and and just the sheer uh, kind of effort that's involved in that on the body is amazing. And we're drawn to this idea, though, in in our culture, particularly, of the solo adventure. Marvelling at incredible feats of humanity. 
Now, incredible as it is that Alex climbed the dawn wall with no ropes, what difference does it make to our lives? Well, not much, does it, if any? Except maybe to Alex's, of course. But if he didn't make the climb, if he fell halfway, well, he might have made a bit more significance in the life of his girlfriend at the time. Because he would have died. For what? To climb a wall? Why am I sharing this? Because this kind of uh, infatuation that we have in our culture with this idea of solo adventures. You know, we've got people who have sailed around the world solo. We've got people that have walked from point A to point B. That's incredible that they did it solo. Right, we, uh, you know, they kayak from uh, Australia to New Zealand solo. Because church is not a solo adventure. Right? Church is not a solo adventure. We're in this together. Alex's solo adventure was about seeking his own glory. The church's mission is all about Helping people see the glory of Jesus. Big difference. So we come to the end of Paul's letter to the Colossians. Paul has shared how he is thankful for this church, uh, that the gospel is bearing fruit in their lives, evidenced by faith and love that he's hearing about. He prays for more of that to continue. That's chapter one. He then reminds them that Jesus is king and saviour. He warns them to not be deceived by the world or false teaching. Uh, He encourages them to keep letting the gospel of of the risen Jesus shape their lives, their their personal holiness, their lives within the church, within their families, in the workplace. And now we come to the final part of his letter. And what does he want the church to know? That as they partner with him in the God-given mission of the church, they're not alone that it's not a solo adventure right it's a team sport and the most important person on the team of course is god <laughs> look how paul ends the letter verse 18 i pra- uh, i paul write this greeting in my own hand now you might think that's a little bit strange but what is actually happening at that moment is Paul is signing off. Okay? It was a common practice. From the most, most of Paul's letters, what he employed, no doubt, was uh, a scribe, someone that he would dictate his letter to, if you like. And here he is saying, this final greeting is in my own hand. He's signing it off, Paul the Apostle. Okay? And then he says, remember my chains, which is effectively a summary of, of what he said earlier in the letter, uh, Chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Remember, I am in chains for you and the good of the gospel in your lives. Even while I am in chains, I am with you and working for you. And then he ends with those words, grace be with you. Now, this isn't just a nice way to end a letter in the first century, a kind of first century version of yours sincerely, Paul. No, Paul is leaving them with a final thought of deep comfort. Grace is shorthand for the one who pours out that grace. God is with them, is what he's reminding them. Just as Jesus reminded the the disciples at the end of Matthew 28, after he had risen and just as he was about to ascend to the throne, he says, go make disciples and surely I am with you always. So Jesus is with us. And we need to do three things that we're going to reflect on that this uh, end to the letter encourages us to do. We need to pray the gospel, we need to proclaim the gospel, and we need to partner in the gospel. So firstly, pray the gospel. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Right? Devote, persevere in. And the key thanksgiving thanksgiving is a big theme in this letter 
Paul models it at the beginning, you know, where he talks about giving thanks to God for the church. Uh, then he instructs the church on how central it is to the life of the church. Verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, he says, Continue to live in Christ, overflowing with thankfulness. Uh, 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Well, what's a part of that? How do you do that? Be thankful. Verse 17, a wonderful verse that sums up the Christian life. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So here's the question as we read those verses. How, how are you going at devoting yourself to prayer? It's always a loaded question, isn't it, really? If you could go over all your prayers from the last month, how much would thankfulness feature? I'm not trying to guilt trip you. Which, <laughs> whenever a preacher talks about prayer, it can quickly descend into, can't it? And why is that? Well, because no one is going to get to heaven and think to themselves, you know what, I think I prayed just the right amount. We all know we can pray more. That's why Paul says it again and again, you know, he wants them to pray continuously. He wants them to devote yourselves to prayer. He's encouraging the church again and again and again because he knows that we're prone for our minds and our habits and all sorts of things to wander away from that which is most important. All right, so that doesn't mean we should give ourselves a free pass, of course. God's word encourages and challenges we should check ourselves regularly against his word, right? His word is the straight edge to our lives. Verse 5, he says, make the most of every opportunity. That, a more literal reading of that verse is make the best use of your time or redeem your time. So do an account. Do an account of how you spend your time. If you were, give, if you were to give that account to someone for the past week, and ask them this question. What would you say that I am devoted to? Would prayer be one of the things that they would list? That's a challenge. Do an account of how you spend your time and see where you may redeem your time and devote yourself to prayer. I mean, if you're able to watch, uh, binge watch, as they say these days, binge watch a TV series... But then you complain that you don't have enough time? Lack of time is not your problem. Priorities is. And what will motivate you to prayer? It's that final note that Paul ends the letter on. That God's grace is with you. That you remind yourself that because of the grace of God, you can come to him unhindered. We have direct access to the throne. Hebrews 4 verses 14 to 16 encourage us with exactly that truth. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, who has taken his place on the throne, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We don't have someone who doesn't know what it's like. We have someone on the throne who knows exactly what it's like to be us. That's what he goes on to say. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And then the writer says, let us approach the throne of grace with trepidation, confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Right, the writer of the Hebrews is... Um, Tapping into that, that wonderful truth that's depicted at, uh, at the moment Jesus dies, when the temple curtain is torn in two. Right? The Holy of Holies, the access to the Holy of Holies has been opened through his sacrifice for us. So we can go straight to the throne with confidence and know that God listens. Why wouldn't you take advantage of that? And Paul goes on to ask for prayer, verses 3 and 4. He says, And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. 
Now, first, notice what Paul doesn't ask prayer for. And he uses his words rather ironically. He says, open doors. Right? He's in chains when he writes this letter. And he doesn't pray, please pray to open a door so that I may walk, so that I may walk free. Now he, he asks, pray that while I'm in chains, that a door may open for me to continue to proclaim the gospel. And that's the very reason he is in chains. So he's prepared to stay in those chains for the sake of the gospel. Paul is prepared to wear those chains if it means he gets to tell people the good news of Jesus. Paul wants the church to pray for the gospel. If we as a church want people to hear the gospel, to respond to the gospel with faith and repentance, then we need to be on our knees praying for that gospel to take root in the lives and hearts of people. So who are you praying for regularly that they may come to faith in Jesus? Can you bring a person to your mind right now who that is? Because if you can't give me an answer to that question, then one of two things maybe needs to change. One, either you need to open your life up more to build relationships with people who need to know Jesus. Or, or and, you need to ask your brothers and sisters who they're building friendships with and pray for them. Remember, it's not a solo adventure. This brings us to the second point. Proclaim the gospel. Verses 5 and 6. Notice how Paul brings the life we live and the words we speak uh, together as he encourages the church to bear witness to the gospel. Verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. To walk in wisdom toward or with outsiders, you need to allow those outside the church into the church. <laughs> and I don't mean into the building. I mean into the life of the church. Remember, the church isn't bricks and mortar. It's people. We need to create the space to share the gospel with someone Sorry, to create the space to share the gospel with someone, you need to spend time with someone. And so verse 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to, you ought to answer each person. Let your speech always be with grace. Always. Unfortunately, in the age of social media, some Christians miss that point. Uh, my mind boggles how some Christians think that doing the work of an evangelist means making others feel stupid or firing back with insults. Always with grace. Now that doesn't mean our speech is all teddy bears and fairy floss. Speaking with grace will inevitably uh, involve helping someone understand the grace of God. Understanding that they are a sinner that deserves hell and that they have no hope of saving themselves. Understanding that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. Things that at times are uncomfortable for people to hear. They're confronting, sometimes awkward. And we're told by Paul to season those conversations with salt. What's he mean? He's drawing on Jesus' image of the church as the salt of the earth. And what did salt do in the ancient world? It preserved food. Right? They didn't have fridges, remember? It preserved food so the meats and foods wouldn't rot. How are we like salt? How do we season our speech with salt? Well, with the thing that we've given, we've been given, that will preserve. The gospel. The ultimate preservative, if you like. As it heals us and prevents us from rotting because of our sin. Notice what Paul doesn't say. Right? He, doesn't say he doesn't say, what you guys need to do is sit them down for a 30-minute lecture on the doctrine of salvation. I mean, if someone wants that, I'll be happy to give it. 
But more often than not, that's not how it works, is it? Right? So he wants us to be ready to answer questions when we're asked. And guess what that means? It, you listen first. That's what we need to do. Most people have a good sense whether or not someone is actually listening to them. We all know this, right? We know when someone is genuinely taking an interest in us. We can feel that. We know when someone's taking our point of view seriously and isn't just kind of drifting off and, and thinking about what they want to say next. And how do people know that? It's because you ask questions. We shouldn't expect to be heard if we haven't first heard them. In most cases, people have lived experiences that we know nothing about, that we need to know about. People have preconceived ideas about Jesus and the church and Christian faith that are often misguided or just plain wrong. But we need to listen to them before we can effectively speak the gospel into their lives. And here is the key. That takes time. It takes energy. It will also mean that you spend time thinking about possible answers to the questions that many people have. Uh, and often the first step is not to give the answer, but as I said, to ask a question. You know, you'll, you'll encounter thoughts like, I don't need God to be good. And so the question might you know, that you might follow up with, well, how do you know what good is? Or maybe uh, I've seen this um, demonstrated online. I haven't actually had this conversation with someone, although I suspect someone I'm talking to at the moment feels this way. Even if God is real, I wouldn't worship him. And you, the question you might ask is, why is that? If the Lord of all creation is real, why wouldn't you want to worship him? Because there's a story behind that statement. Or maybe, uh, and this I have encountered, you know, oh, Jesus was probably a real person. He, you know, he's a, he was a bit of a good teacher, morals and all that. But nothing like the Jesus that we read about in the Gospels. And you might ask the question, why do you think that is? Why don't, why don't you trust that the Gospels are accurate? And you can explore that thing, that, that statement with them. Proclaiming the gospel as we walk in wisdom with our friends who are not believers. Right? The two go hand in hand. We open our homes to people so we can open the gospel with people. Uh, and I'm going to get a little bit technical, I guess is the word. I don't know. I'm going to show you some diagrams is basically what I mean. Because I found these very helpful as, as I was thinking about this. And I've, I've heard about this before. I don't think I've shared with you this before. Uh, so I'll explain some stuff, basically. <laughs> Bounded set versus centred set. Now, most of you are probably going, what on earth is Christian talking about? Well, here we go. Two ways to think about the church. A bounded set. A bounded set is where you have a clearly defined boundary that defines who is in and who is out. Now, that is a re relatively traditional way that uh, the church has thought of herself. Right? We have a clearly defined boundary that determines who is in the church and who is out the church. Okay? And that there is a place for that. But the thinking is shifting and they talk more about a centred set. What's a centred set? A centred set has a focal point. A centre to which you are moving either towards or away from. And the thinking is that the church needs to be more of a centred set. Leading people to Christ. And here's the thing. Both are true. Right? So church really looks a bit like that. Right? We need uh, a bounded set. We need that definition Otherwise, people are going to be just living in, in the grey. We want people to be assured of their faith when they come to faith, right? That they are a part of God's people. But we also want the focal point not to be on the boundary, but on where we're headed. To Jesus. And so, when, when in times gone past, 
the, the evangelistic method, the way we shared the gospel, if you like, was we, we would share the gospel out there, wait for people to believe, and then they would belong. They would come and be a part of the church. That's not the way it works for most people, though, is it? What happens is actually the reverse. People come and mix with you, the church, either here on a Sunday or in a small group or in your home for dinner, whatever it might be, and they get a sense and grow in a sense of belonging and they move towards believing. Okay? But the only thing you know, that should stop someone coming through those doors on a Sunday is themselves. If we're putting hurdles in the way of people to hear the gospel, then we're doing something wrong. Right? We want to be focused on Jesus, helping others move towards him to be, and this is kind of neat, unintentionally neat, but when I put both of them over together, in the centre, what does it say? In Christ. <laughs> now, as we help others move towards Jesus, there are three key elements. But as I was thinking about this, uh, and coming out of the passage, it's this. Grace and love, truth and time. Who doesn't love a Venn diagram? All right. And so we see these things coming together as we seek to share the good news of Jesus. Grace and love, that life filled with unbelievers, not judging them, but loving them, showing them grace by not expecting them to live like Christians before they become Christians. Truth, right? The gospel, it's, it has to be there because it's good news. It's something that's communicated. It's truth that is proclaimed, right? Nothing more, into, more important. Eternal significance. And of course, time. We work to God's timetable, not our own though. And God is far more patient with others than we often are. We need to allow time for the Spirit to do His thing. I mean, we don't control the Spirit any more than we control the direction of the wind. And here's the thing, wonderful thing about Venn diagrams. You have grace and time, but not truth. What are you going to end up doing? You're going to end up starving people. Starving people of the bread of life that they need to hear about. What about if you have grace and truth but not time? Well, either you give up on them because, you know, at the first instance that you shared the gospel with them, they didn't drop to the floor on their knees and say, Jesus is Lord. Right? Or you expect them to change too quickly. And that will cause doubt in your mind. It will cause doubt in their minds, not really knowing if they are Christian or not because they haven't changed according to your timetable instead of God's. What about if you have truth and time but not grace? You will crush them as they feel more like your project than your friend. If we preach about God's love and grace in Jesus, people need to see God's love and grace in Jesus, in us. That doesn't mean there are moments, of course, where God's word is shared and, and, and God does amazing things. We heard this uh, a wonderful quick uh, account um, that someone shared at assembly the past week. Uh, a gentleman named Luke, uh, who was a farmer out west, he heard someone read a sermon, uh, a sermon that was written by a 16th century Puritan named John Flavel. Uh, and he heard this sermon when he was 15. 75 years later, yes, he was 90, still working on the farm. 75 years later, working on the farm, stopped for a smoko, and he suddenly remembers that talk. And he puts his faith in Jesus. Right? God's word is where the power's at. That's true. But there is a sweet spot for us that the, the scriptures take us to, and it's those three things. Right? Grace and love, truth and time. And don't read this as a guide to your solo adventure either. The church's mission to share the good news is a team sport. And the gospel, uh, sorry, uh, is a team sport. And the goal is that we're all involved in that in various ways, at various times, to hit that sweet spot. Right? 
It might be a case of you've been loving them and spending time with them and an opportunity comes to invite them to something where I share the truth with them. Sweet spot. This doesn't absolve any of us, though, from being loving and gracious, of course. (laughs) It's not like, well, I'm just going to focus on the truth. No, 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 no. We should seek to bring all three of those things into our lives as we share the gospel. But, point three, we partner in the gospel. It's not a solo adventure. It's a team sport. Verses 7 to 17. Sometimes we might get to a list of names like this at the end of Paul's letter and think, nothing really to see here, just a bunch of names. But these names are a part of God's word to you. So what is he saying to us? Well, firstly, these are real people. People who were a part of the early church. People who partner in the work of the gospel so that you and I can sit here today to know the truth about Jesus. And one day in the new creation, you'll be able to say hi and have a chat with Aristarchus or Epaphras or Onesimus. These parts of the New Testament really, they really undermine and the uninformed accusation sometimes leveled at the New Testament, that it's just fiction, propaganda made up to spread the Christian faith. No, these were letters written by real people to real churches to talk and teach them about the real Jesus. Secondly, the mission of the church to proclaim the gospel is a team sport. We all have a part to play. You're not alone. People are laboring in the gospel for you and with you. People are praying for you and with you. You know what? That hasn't changed. There have been a number of people who have worked among you sharing the gospel in this town that have helped build this church up in Jesus. And it just so happens that I have a couple of them who have sent greetings. So there are, I've been here for 12 years. The minister before me was a guy named Al Burke. And the minister before him was a, a gentleman named Russell Vandervelden. And I asked them to write you a letter. And so they write. Dear Kuna Church family, I do think about you often and pray for you regularly. Now, of course, not all of you know who I was just talking about, but some of you do. But that's the point as well, isn't it? We've got people praying for us that we don't even know are praying for us. Dear Kuna Church family, I do think about you often and pray for you regularly. You are a church family which is very close to my heart. You taught me a lot about what it is to love each other as family, how to share our lives and show enormous generosity. My prayer is that you would all continue to grow in the love of Jesus and an understanding of his amazing grace. Love you, brothers and sisters. Al. With deep affection, Liana and I send greetings to Coonabarabran Presbyterian Church, with whom we laboured in the past to re-establish a stronghold for the gospel of our Lord Jesus. God, our Father, continues to answer prayers offered up 26 years ago. The Coonabarabran Presbyterian would be a light for the gospel. A faithful witness standing firm with confidence in Jesus, who is the only name under heaven by which men can be saved. Continue to stand firm then, not being swayed by false gospels as you reach out with love and grace to share the living hope we have in Christ. Never give up. God is faithful and will indeed continue to bring into his kingdom those he chose through your labours and witness of Jesus. Live lives worthy of the gospel you have received for his glory and praise. Russ and Liana. Pretty neat, eh? You're not alone. The church is much bigger than Coonabarabran. (laughs) We are partners in the gospel. To finish our our, our time, uh, our the the talk today, and the letter to the Colossians, I want to show you a video. A video that I have showed before, so some of you will recognise it. Many of you weren't here at that point, I don't think. Uh, It's a video uh, of a lady named Rosaria Butterfield. 
uh, and she talks about how she came to faith. Uh, now, Rosaria, at, at the time, uh, before she came to faith, she was a, a professor of women and gender studies at Syracuse University in the United States. She was an out and proud lesbian woman in uh, a relationship. Um, and she tells her story in this little clip. Uh, you can read about it in, in depth uh, in a book called Secrets of an Unlikely Convert. Uh, and she has another great book uh, that encourages us in our, in our efforts to reach the gospel through hospitality. It's called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. I recommend both to you. But listen to her story now. And notice the kinds of things coming out that we've just been talking about. Prayer and thanksgiving, uh, focused on Jesus, partnering in the gospel, grace, truth and time. And how Jesus worked in her life through his faithful servants. We live at this time where so many Christian ideas are understood as hate speech. After the Obergefell decision legalized gay marriage, that put the gospel on a collision course with the new law of the land. And I think many Christians have been struggling with, well, how do I speak? What do I do? How do I move forward? Home is a vital place to invite your neighbors in to have some heartfelt conversations. We can love our children together. We can let some things slide, even though the world we live in would say that we're supposed to be enemies. To me, hospitality is the ground zero of the Christian faith. I was raised in an Italian family. There were some issues in my house that made it almost impossible to have people in. So hospitality didn't really become endemic to my life until I had set up a home of my own. I was a professor at Syracuse. I lived as an out lesbian feminist in New York. In our LGBTQ community, somebody's home was open every night of the week. And there was never a question, where will I go if I need help? Because the community itself is organic and fluid, and that was how we dealt with crises. After I wrote my tenure book, I really wanted to write a book that was on my heart. Why is the religious right such a hateful community? And why do they hate people like me? I was on a war against two things, patriarchy and stupid. So I was really curious to know why relatively decent people would use the Bible in such a hateful way. So I wrote an editorial and it brought all kinds of attention my way, which I didn't really expect. But one of the things that brought my way was a letter from Ken Smith, the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. When Ken and his wife Floyd invited me to dinner, I was happy. I, th I thought of Ken as my unpaid research assistant. And they were fine with the fact that I, I wanted to read the Bible to critique it. That began a research journey that changed my life. But it wasn't research that changed my life. In Ken and Floyd's home, the way that they practiced hospitality became a living, breathing example of the theology that they were teaching. After my first dinner at Ken and Floyd's house, Ken gave me a big hug, Floyd gave me a big hug and a kiss on the cheek. We said, we'll catch up next week. This was fun, can't wait to do it again. They did not share the gospel with me and they did not invite me to church. And that was so wonderful because what it showed to me was that they didn't see me as a project. They actually saw me as a neighbor. Now, I didn't step foot in the church for two years, but every week I was in their home. And every week, it was clear that pretty much anything could go. We could ask anything, Ken and Floyd were fine. And that process of dialogue and table fellowship was compelling. It was deeply compelling. 
I did not come to faith because I stopped feeling like a lesbian. It's not that I got all of my worldview issues just completely cemented with a happy Christian evangelism, not at all. I came to faith because I became convicted that Jesus is who he says he is. Ephesians 4.29 is our watchword, that we are to impart grace to the hearer. I might not agree with everything that you hold to be near and dear, but because we are neighbors, I don't have to say everything that's on my heart. And you don't have to say everything that's on your heart right now. We can put some of our worldview issues aside. And over years of this, the gospel takes on a momentum that is compelling to people. I think we need to give each other the reminder that it's God who saves. It's not about certainly us being perfect or our words being perfect, but show up we must in the lives of unbelievers. What comes naturally to me and what comes naturally to you is to hang out with people who are like us, <laughs> people who can maybe finish our sentences, people who don't scare us, but hospitality, biblically speaking, takes strangers and makes them neighbors, and takes neighbors and makes them family of God. It's a great joy to see the gospel bring people together who are supposed to be enemies, and it's a great joy to know that God never gets the address wrong. And if your neighbors aren't people you know yet, there's a blessing waiting for you. that line and did you see how it's it, it talks about that belonging leading to believing take strangers and make them neighbors take neighbors and make them brothers and sisters in the lord pray the gospel proclaim the gospel and partner in the gospel there's the mission we've been given let's pray gracious and heavenly father we thank you for the gospel the good news of your son Jesus who died and rose again for us. And as we seek to share that gospel in the lives of those around us, guide us, we pray. Give us grace and humble hearts. Help us to be patient and help us to speak the truth. That in your time, more people would come to know and trust and love Jesus. That we would see the gospel take root in the hearts of many. Lord, we pray this for your glory. And in Jesus' name. Amen.